Now, meanwhile, the Hamas-run Ministry of Health in Gaza says 1,000 people have either been killed or wounded in Israeli strikes on the Jabalia refugee camp. And Doctors Without Borders says there are now about 20,000 wounded in Gaza. Our next guest is the president of the International Network for Aid Relief and Assistance, which has people conducting aid responses in Gaza right now. She's also a former war correspondent. Arwa Damon is in Istanbul. So, uh, Arwa, it, it is good to see you under these horrible circumstances. I know that you have medical contacts in Gaza. What are they telling you about their ability to deal with this level of calamity, really, in the region? A lot of what you're seeing right now, Travis, is really just triage to a certain degree. I mean, even hospitals are having to act like triage systems in the sense that they're having to pick and choose who they can operate on and basically who gets to live or die. Uh, one of Inara, my charity's founding members, Dr. Hassan Abu Sitta, he's been inside Gaza since about day two. And he's been telling us about the severe shortage in anesthesia, which has resulted to uh, some people, including children, having to undergo very intense, very painful procedures without proper anesthesia. There's no morphine uh, left anywhere, at least none that he can access, which means that once a child or an adult have gone through surgery, there is really no relief for their pain. He describes uh, each surgical uh, procedure as initially starting off as something of a scavenger hunt. You have to go for the scalpels that you can use. You have to look for solutions. They're running out of ways to properly be able to clean the sort of severe injuries that you see, especially with the way that debris just gets embedded in them. Gaza's only cancer facility has gone offline. If you are a cancer patient in Gaza right now, you cannot get treatment. The Indonesian hospital has just warned this morning, put out an announcement saying that its main generator has no more fuel. They're unable to run oxygen machines. Across the Gaza Strip, you have about six uh, hospitals that have um, NICUs for premature babies. They're also at risk of running out of uh, electricity because they don't have fuel. And when you look at the humanitarian aid that's going across, it's barely 10% of what Gaza used to get in normal times. It is, it is incredible. Uh, I, I want to ask you about this. The United Nations Human Rights Office said on Wednesday it was concerned that Israeli airstrikes on Gaza's Jabalia refugee camp could amount to war crimes. Uh, I, I mean, you were a former war correspondent. Given your experience covering wars, what do you make of that? Look, if you look at the Geneva Convention and the actual rhetoric around the whole concept of proportionality, one of the, the sort of big flaws in that, if you will, is that it leaves it up to interpretation. But to sort of try to summarize and simplify it, it does basically say that carrying out a strike that is going to cause civilian deaths could be acceptable if it is deemed that the military gains are worth whatever collateral damage, i.e. civilian casualties, do occur. So again, it's very vague and it leaves itself open to a lot of interpretation, this whole concept of proportionality. Another thing, though, that experts are pointing to is that aside from these ongoing strikes that Israel is carrying out on a daily basis that are causing mass civilian casualties, is something else that is outlined in the Geneva Convention, and that is that collective punishment is a crime. You cannot collectively punish an entire population for the actions uh, of the few. What we are seeing being carried out by Israel uh, in Gaza with the full siege of Gaza is collective punishment. Uh, it is also a violation of international humanitarian law to deliberately cut off access to humanitarian aid. So those are other aspects of you know, the, the whole conversation about is what Israel is doing a violation of international law, and is it a war crime? And many experts who know the Geneva Convention far better than I do right now are coming out and saying, yes, it absolutely is. And, of course, Israel saying that they need to do this to uh, strike uh, at Hamas. I, I, 
Obviously, the numbers, we're going to get more clarity on that in the coming days because right now uh, there are discrepancies. I, I know that you are in contact, or at least trying to be in contact, with members of your aid agency inside Gaza, but communications, as we know, uh, are, are inconsistent at the best of times. So what is that like right now, and how has that complicated the aid effort? Uh, to be clear, uh, right now, you know, we do have Dr. Hassan uh, in Gaza, and what we're actually trying to do is get in touch with appropriate organizations, get in touch with teams on the ground, get in touch with teams across Palestine to see how we can also, within the space that we specifically operate in, uh, as Inara, get more support inside Gaza. It's extraordinarily difficult for any organization that is trying to operate uh, under these circumstances. And one has to remember and, you know, really appreciate what those who are inside are trying to do, because every single person in Gaza is not just trying to respond to this if they're in the humanitarian space. They are also living it every single day. They're living the same level of fear. They're living the same crippling conditions. They're living with the same food and water shortages. What we're seeing in Gaza right now really eclipses anything that I have witnessed in the last 20 years, covering war uh, as a correspondent, but also responding to the humanitarian impacts of war. And I mean, the bottom line is, you know, more humanitarian aid has to go in. Look, Israel will say this, everyone will say this, war causes civilian casualties, war causes pain and suffering. We know this. But war absolutely, most certainly, does not need to cause the level of casualties or the level of suffering that we're seeing inside Gaza right now. And the burden of responsibility to reduce that does lie on the democratically elected nation state. And getting people out right now is so crucial. The Rafa boarding, uh, the Rafa border, that is, that we, we spoke about uh, this morning, is being open for limited crossing for those severely injured and for nationals. What are your contacts telling you about this? What do you know about that this morning? Well, as far as we can tell, you know, 80 some of the severely injured were able to get out yesterday. There's about another 60 or so that are expected uh, to cross today as part of an international network of aid organizations. Uh, there's also a lot of effort to be made to see of what can be done on the Egyptian side of the border. How can things be scaled up uh, there to be able to potentially perhaps treat more um, of the injured? In terms of people that are being permitted to cross, there are reports that some of Doctors Without Borders uh, foreign staff have uh, also been able to cross out. Um, and the dual nationals at the moment are the only people that are being allowed to cross out, keeping in mind that it's a very specific list that's out there. And every single person on that list has gone through and then does again go through a very, very lengthy and tedious screening process. So this is very much, if anything, a controlled excruciatingly slow effort to at least get dual nationals out of Gaza at this stage. Arwa, appreciate you chatting with us again this morning. We'll chat again soon. That is the president of the International Network for Aid, Relief and Assistance and former war correspondent Arwa Damon in Istanbul.